Well, we uh, went through Lent and Easter season looking at miracles. Um, and Igor's pedal here, for a control guy, there's, there's two arrows, one that goes up and one that goes down. And I just want to go over here and click and find out what I'm doing here. I mean, does it eject somebody or, you know, does it jiggle a seat and wake somebody up? Or it's a little... <laughs> Uh, so if you see me kick a box out of the way here in a minute, it's, <laughs> no, 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 I'll deal with the distraction, thanks. Um, but we're getting back to our study in numbers, okay? So we're taking it in chunks. It's a book that typically when you're reading through your Bible in a year, uh, Numbers or Leviticus, sometimes will trip you up. And I, and I don't think it needs to. I think there is uh, substance here for us to study as, as all the Word of God. Um, If you've got a device or a pew Bible in front of you, we're going to look at Numbers 13. We're going to study Numbers through um, the beginning of the summer, and then we'll do a summer series as well, um, as we normally do. And then we'll come back and probably finish off the book, hopefully before Advent um, this fall. Um, Just to bring you up to speed, Numbers is called Numbers because it's the book of two censuses, okay? Where where God in chapter 1 has Moses number the people. And we're going to see that there's over 600, 650,000 fighting men. And today we're going to see why there's going to be a second census, uh, actually this week and next week. I wish we had enough time to do chapters 13 and 14 together, but today is going to be the beginning of the end of the first generation because they're going to make some bad decisions and God's going to say, not until this generation falls will we go into the land, all right? But so you've got a census in chapter 1, and then you've got the arrangement of the camp, the duty of the priest and the people, the setting up and the dedication of the tabernacle where we see God come back where he used to live with Adam and Eve in the garden. Now he's going to come into a tabernacle and be Emmanuel again. We're going to see that in the future in the temple, but then also in Christ and now in us, that God has always desired to be the God with us in relationship with us. All right? And that's big because, as Jesus said, as we looked at in the Great Commission in the last couple of weeks, is that he is always with us. He desires to be in relationship. All right? We're going to see the movement. uh, Well, Passover, we celebrated Passover in chapter 9. Then after that Passover, which is a big remembrance of what God has done. And and you're going to see that when we forget what God has done, then we do things on our own. We think we have to take back control, all right? You've got to um, be able to be the person doing it. And, and the movement and the march is going to begin in chapter 10, and it doesn't take long for walking in their shoes before complaints are going to come forth, and they're going to say, we don't like the food, we don't like this, and they're going to get quail coming out their nose in chapter 11, literally, all right? And then not only the people, but we're going to see the top leadership. Miriam and Aaron are going to complain in chapter 12. Miriam's going to get struck with leprosy for a week, which is gracious because it's usually a two-week out of the camp and everybody was going to move, but they decided um, we won't move. God said don't move and we'll limit her to seven days out. So all that has come to pass. Now they're getting ready to enter the land. We get to chapter 13. And Moses is going to set them up so that they can see what's coming. So I'm going to read just for time's sake um, a portion from the beginning and the end of chapter 13. If you're in Numbers 13, you can open your device or your Bibles there. In Numbers 13, verse 1, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them, men who are heads of the people of Israel. Chapters, or verses 4 to 16 are going to list all those, and then 17 is going to send them out, and he's going to tell them what to do. And then down at 25, it says, at the end of 40 days, so they went into the land, at the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron, and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, We came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. 
and then we go south. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The, uh, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are. And thus saith the word of God. Christianity is a life that lives in tension in a constant battle. Sometimes I think we try to uh, ibuprofen ourselves. We try to take pain relief. We try to make walls and strategize so that we can live in a comfortable environment and not know uh, the circumstances. We protect our kids. We protect our families. We protect our workforce, everything from the circumstances. And I'm not saying all of that is wrong, uh, but it's our flesh that longs for this comfort and this contentment in the midst of everything. We fear pain, uh, not getting our due attention. We, we fear not getting our share. We fear that we're not gonna accomplish our ambitions or the things that we want in this life. Are we getting our piece of the pie? Are we taking our place among the people? But our faith says to walk in these circumstances not selfishly, but selflessly. And not just focused on self, but actually in all abandonment to Him. That we come to Him with open hands. We say these things all the time. That we come to Him on bended knees, knowing that He's our sovereign, that we're submitted. And it works for a time in prayer, it works for our times in devotion, but oftentimes we get up from those 30 minutes, 90 minutes, however long it is, and then we go back and we claim it in our own strength. We need to believe in the face of unbelief. We need to understand His ways are not our ways. To be firm in our faith, not retreating in fear. To understand He is with us, and that there's nothing that should cause us to succumb to doubt and unbelief. We have the choice almost daily, minute by minute, to choose between fear and unbelief or faith and understanding, and understanding being following after Him. <laughs> the Lord spoke to Moses in verse 1, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan. So they have come out of enslavement, they've walked through the sea, they've seen the miracles of Moses, they've seen the, uh, the, the work of God through his leader. They have these milestones that are lined up. I mean, we've made movies to watch them, all right? And yet it's like they've got this memory that lasts only to the last meal, if that long. Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. That should be enough. All right, we, we overlook this first verse. I am giving. Yeah, I'm going to use you to take it. You're going to be the hand. Uh, you're going to be my hands. You're going to be my instruments of delivering the land. But I am giving to the people of Israel. From long ago, I have promised. To Abraham, I promised. A land, a seed, and a blessing. And now it's coming into fruition. Let's go. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man. So there's going to be representative government here. Just like Adam represents all of humanity, here one from each of the tribe is going to go in to go look and to come back and tell. The problem is they're going to overstep their job description when they come back. They're not just going to uh, give their observations, but they're going to give their own interpretation. They're going to take it out of God's hands and put it into humanistic meaning. Not, is he going to give us the land? Hey, we can't take it. And they switch the word of God. In fact, they hit control, all, all delete, and they do away with the word of God. 
Their duty was to go and tell what they saw. So Moses sent them from the wilderness, according to the command of the Lord, all the men who were heads of the people of Israel. So these were people who were respected in each of the tribes. And in verses 4 to 16, it lists them on. If you go through, you'll see that there's 12 tribes with 12 people. Uh, two of note in verse 6, Caleb. In verse 8, Hosea, which you're going to see his name is actually going to be changed to Joshua in verse 16. And Caleb and Joshua are the only ones that are going to come back and do the job correctly. Hosea, by the way, means salvation, and Joshua means uh, that uh, Yahweh is our salvation. And somewhere Moses renamed the guy. Each of the tribes that we've seen in arraignment, ar arrangement around the tabernacle, in their marching, in their going forth, in their selection, they're all represented here. These were the names of the men in verse 16 whom Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Joshua. He had already caught Moses' attention, and it's a little bit of a foreshadow if we keep working our way uh, through the Old Testament as we have been over the last decade or so. We'll get to Joshua as well, and we'll see that he's going to play uh, a big part in the going into the land. So verse 17, Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up into the Negev and go into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and whether the land that they dwell in is, a, is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not. He's not asking them to go find out so that they can make a decision on whether or not they're going in. All right? That's not the case. He's telling them, go tell us what we're about to face because we're going in. We're going in. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. He was hoping this would be an encouragement because God had said it's the land of milk and honey. It's the land of fruitfulness. It's the land of great, bountiful things. And it is yours that I am to give you. And it was the season of first ripe grapes, which if you read through the Bible at all, uh, you know that Israel had some French blood in it because there, there's wine throughout. There's grapes throughout. Okay? And it was a sign of first fruits. It was a sign of blessing. It was a sign of God's loving giftedness to them. Small, but constant. So Moses gives them the duty of going, seeing, and reporting. Bring back some fruit, and then we'll do what God has asked of us to do. So far, so good. They went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rehob near Labo Hamath. They went up from the Negev and, and came to Hebron, Aiman, Shashai, and Talmai. The descendants of Anak were there. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. There's, uh, you can read about the Anak or the Nephilim or any of these guys that have some kind of history in the Old Testament. They were just big guys. Okay? Um, just huge, bigger-than-life mercenary types. If you've ever been to uh, an American football game, those type of guys. All right? But bigger. All right. Um, it talks about Hebron, which was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. That would have placed uh, Hebron at probably about 1,800 years uh, before Christ. Um, why it's pointed out could be a couple of different reasons. It's where David uh, puts his kingdom start uh, at the beginning. But I think probably more importantly, it's the area where Caleb, in about 40 years is going to go in at the age of 80-something and knock the Anax out of there, him and three sons. Which, not to give away, you already know the story, but not to give away all the thunder of this, um, there's 650,000 guys who will not go in and will not conquer that area that Caleb is eventually going to go in with his three boys, which are probably grown men by that time as well, 
and, and knock the giants out of the land. And just in real quick summary, it's not about us. It's about God. Okay? And so they come to the Valley of Eshaw. They cut down um, from there a branch, uh, which I think Eshaw actually means is like a, a branch uh, with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two of them. So it's not like picking up grapes at Leclerc and bringing them home in your cart. This was some huge form that required two men to carry them out. So not only were the people giants, but the fruit were giants. They also brought some pomegranates and figs. The place was called the Valley of Eschol because the cluster that the people of the Israel cut down from there. So the itinerary has taken the explorers, you know, they began, they began in the desert and it extended far north and it goes all the way down and it goes across different parts of what would be future Israel. And they're just getting a survey. What's going on? So far... So good. At the end of 40 days, verse 25, they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word of them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Everything's fine here. All 12 spies would have been saying the same thing. All guys had the same kind of reconnaissance. In fact, even after the fact, I don't think Caleb and Joshua would change their story. They would say, yeah, there's big guys. Yeah, there's big fruit. There's fortified cities. They're numerous. But their focus wasn't the same as the however men. And that's where we go wrong in verse 28. However... Yeah, we saw all this, however. Yeah, there are people and there is fruit and there is a land there like you told us and promised to give us, however. Isn't this your spiritual life? It is mine. God calls on me to do, to be faithful in a certain way, and I start becoming debate team captain. All right? However. You know, in my circumstances, you know, with five kids and as busy as I am and all the work I do for you and do this, however, maybe just this time, really, I don't fall under this and the word doesn't apply to me. However, you understand, and if not, grace will win out, right? However. The people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. So all these enemies... All these warrior type people, all these fortified places are against us. But I would like to contend, as Jesus said in the Great Commission, I am with you, that numbers is consistent with that 2,000 years before. 2,000 years before, Numbers teaches us that when God is with his people, when Emmanuel, when the, he walks in the garden, when he sits in the tabernacle, when he is in the temple, when he comes in the form of Christ, when he lives within our bodies, that his desire has always be, been to be in relationship with us. And when we break that relationship, like we saw last week, he cuts the distance and tries to restore and that when God is with us, which he desires to be, the only thing we need to fear is really ourselves. Will we submit? Will we follow? Will we live in abandonment to him? You know, John 3.30, my favorite verse in the Bible that 
that he must become more and I must become less. In every situation when I'm ready to lay out the however card, it's me saying, wait a second, I don't want you to become more yet. I think I want to hold on to me and my circumstances, my flesh, my comfort, my contentment, my choice right here and now. However, God, I know you say, but. However, God, I think this may be a little bit different. However. And I become my worst nightmare. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, so Caleb's going to stand up in the midst of peer pressure, in the midst of the crowd saying, we can't do this, in the midst of probably large gatherings of the Israelites who do not want to go in and suffer this way. Caleb's going with God. Caleb's going to go with what he knows the word to be. Let us go up at once and occupy it. Do you not hear? There's big people. There's fortified cities. We are well able to overcome it. How are we well able to overcome it? Have you looked at us? We've got a couple slings, maybe a spear here or there. We've been in slavery for this many decades. These guys are trained. They kill you in their sleep. When God is on your side, and when you align with Him, you are the majority. Even if the numbers don't add up, humanly speaking, you plus God equals success. Always. And I know your minds are running, well, sometimes he lets you die. Yes, he does. He does. And that, too, is success ultimately because you attain to the faith that we're all headed for. Whether we die in our sleep or we die at war, our hope is to get to heaven. Unless Jesus comes during our day, we're all going to breathe that last breath, heart's going to beat the last time, and we're going to experience death, but not death. He will never leave you. Let us go. We are well able. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. Humanly speaking, that's a correct statement. Humanly speaking. Circumstances, you plot it out. You put the pros and cons out there. They've got more this, more that, more everything. They've got home field advantage. They've got weaponry. They've got logistics. They've got it all. And what have we got? Faith. And sometimes we think faith is not enough. Faith is what moves you from hell to heaven. Faith is what puts you in right relationship with God. Faith is what takes away your eternal destruction. Faith is what allows you to align yourself and get conformed to Him. Faith is really powerful. But living in it can sometimes be difficult. Because we don't look able to go up against the people. They definitely look stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land. The land through which, is, through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seem to them. David was a red-haired, ruddy, small guy. 
He wasn't that big of stature. I know you can go um, over to Florence and see the statue and he seems enormous and it's one of my favorite pieces of art, but he was really small. And yet, he knew that this giant had no right to be yelling those vulgarities. And he knew that his God was capable. He didn't need the armor of Saul. He really didn't need all five stones. Just one. Yeah, a nice old story. There were 11 who were as feeble as you can find, as we studied, as we saw in a lot of these miracles as we went going. Uh, there were 11 that weren't that powerful, weren't that strong, weren't that educated, weren't that capable. And yet, in the book of Acts, it says they turn the world upside down. That Sabbath changes from Saturday to Sunday. A belief system goes forth in all the countries of the world. People are willing to give up their lives even 2,000 years later for the sake of this man named Jesus Christ. Eleven. Against the whole Roman Empire. And we still exist. We sit here today. We look at his word today because they didn't fold in their flesh, but they found faith to be enough. As I said earlier, it's interesting that it will be Caleb at 80 plus years who will take on Hebron, the Anakites. He'll have his three boys with him but they will run those guys out of there. I, I can't imagine the level of frustration for Caleb uh, to have to walk around for 40 years while he and his buddy Joshua were content to obey the Lord and to watch everyone else just die off. I mean, at some point, I can see them having coffee somewhere going, hey, there's only five left. I mean, how grueling to go through a decision that your country makes and you have to live with. Kind of sounds familiar, huh? We live in a culture that makes laws and decisions not based upon faith, but based upon how they feel, how they desire, how they want to live free of anyone saying something is sinful. And yet we're called to be the Caleb to stand up in the middle of that and say, no, no. There's a better way. There's a way of faith. God speaks to his people through the word. When God speaks, we are to obey. God's word is more reliable than the nightly news. Promise you more reliable than the latest textbook coming out of the ivory tower. Not that you can't find some good stuff in both of those sources, but the best stuff, the right way, is found in Him. Sometimes Christianity falters, I think, because what we want from God is His gifts and not not the means of transforming us. That, that being transformed often requires a refining fire where you put the, the uh, delicate metal into a fire that it just burns it and burns it and burns it and gets rid of all the dross so that we can come out on the other side or so that the metal can come out on the other side pure. And we're likened to that in the Bible, that we have to go through. We share in the suffering of Christ. We share in the suffering of the believers before us so that we can be tempered. We can be purified. We can be made into His image. And we want that. We want to be more like Him. It's just this path, this faith that's required.
in Jeremiah 45, 5, um, it says, Seekest thou great things for thyself? Is what it says. And it says, though, after that, And do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. For behold, I am bringing disaster upon all flesh, declares the Lord. Don't put this life first. Don't think the roots that are going deep into the earth here are of substantial, chronologically speaking. And he ends that chapter with saying, but I will give you your life. Your life is a prize of war in all places in which you may go. Do not seek great things for yourself. Do not look for the treasures of this world. Do not be building kingdoms here. Do not put your emphasis on the things that are going to rust, rot, be destroyed, or stolen. Matthew 6. For behold, I am bringing disaster upon all flesh. It's all going to pass. This world and its ways are going down. But I, God, will give you your life as a prize of war, the Christian struggle, the battle in which we are in. You're going to come out with your life intact, no matter how you get there. In Him, by faith, you will end up better than anything you could do here. Easy to say. Hard to walk. I know. <coughs> Applications. For that abandonment, you need what God is trying to give you. Relationship. He is constantly cutting the distance. He's constantly bringing you to repentance and confession. He's constantly forgiving you and accepting you and bringing you near. What you need to do is proximity. Make sure that you are close to him. Use every tool that he has given you. Get in his word and know what he says. Get amongst his people and see how we're supposed to live. Encourage each other to do what's right. I was listening to a parenting thing uh, just yesterday, and it says, if your friends are encouraging you to do something that's harmful to you, they are not your friends. And we try to instill that into our children, but we need to remember for ourselves, for our spiritual life, if someone in the world or if the world and its ways are encouraging me to do something that is harmful to my relationship with God, they're not my friends. It's not on my side. It's not for my betterment. Word, people, prayer, not that we're getting him to give us gifts, but we're getting him to conform us to his image. And sacrifice, which usually comes out in the form of good deeds. That when you give, when you give of your time, your treasures, your talents, that that sacrifice teaches you the blessing that it is to live not in a selfish manner, but in a selfless manner. And all these things are here in Numbers. God tells Moses to tell his people. His people are supposed to believe that when he says, we're going to give you the land, that God's going to give you the land, the land's going to be given to you. Not that you can't take assessment of your tools and your abilities. But if God has told us not to live in this way, not to do things in that way, then we can trust him that it's the best way. That Christianity is a call from this world into a life of relationship with the next world. That we begin introducing ourselves and getting to know our Lord and God. And we do that by walking in a way that he calls us to live, not by sight, but by faith. Abandonment. Listening to God. Obeying and following Him. 
Our last application for the day is going to be communion. Uh, communion is, is actually us testifying that we do believe, we do desire, we want to walk in that relationship with Him. That when we take the bread, we remember His life. When we take the cup, we remember His sacrifice. And remembering that life and that sacrifice, we bring ourselves back to belief that it's not about these circumstances. It's about heaven who sent Jesus to reconcile us to God, that we may be in relationship with him forever and ever and ever. Igor and Jazzy are going to come up and sing a song while we pass out the elements. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, whether you're not, you're a member here, you're welcome to partake in uh, the Lord's Supper with us. Um, after the elements are passed out, I'll come back and we'll stand and read the text and, and take communion together.